Hola, ¿cómo estás? Espero que estés súper bien. This is Tamara Marie, host of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. Now, before we jump into this episode, I wanted to let you know about a special opportunity that you're definitely going to want to take advantage of, especially if your goal is to become fluent in Spanish. For a limited time only, my team is opening the doors to listeners of the podcast to take advantage of a free language coaching session. Now, in this session, it's not just we're teaching you about verbs or grammar, but we're really going to do a deep dive into what are your goals for learning Spanish, assess where you are on your journey to fluency at the moment, and help you map out a 90-day plan for how you can get to fluency. So we are going to help you take your Spanish to the next level, whether you're afraid of speaking Spanish or you just get a little bit nervous when you're talking to native speakers, or maybe you've got some of the basics down, but you really know that you struggle with getting your Spanish to flow and your listening skills aren't up to par. Whatever it is, even if it is a specific grammar issue, we will help you map out how to tackle that. And normally these sessions do cost, so we are offering a few slots for free. There are limited spaces available and they'll only be open up through the end of the month. So make sure you sign up. Go to SpanishConSalsa.com slash coach. That's SpanishConSalsa.com slash coach to book your free language coaching session where we will help you map out a 90-day plan to get to Spanish fluency. Okay, let's get started with the episode. If you've been a listener of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast for some time, then you already know that music is a powerful tool for learning Spanish. That's why I know you'll absolutely love the Learn Spanish with Music course. This is the only comprehensive Spanish course that uses authentic Latin music to teach you how native speakers actually use the language. In less than 15 minutes a day, you can tune your ear to both hear and understand fast-paced spoken Spanish. You'll also increase your vocabulary and naturally absorb grammar structures just by listening to music you enjoy. When you enroll in the Learn Spanish with Music course, you can go from the beginner level to intermediate in less than six months, all while having fun in the process. And finally, you'll be able to understand all those songs on your Latin music playlist. And with lifetime access, you can go at your own pace. Take advantage of our Black Friday sale. Where we're offering a steep discount off the regular course price, plus some bonuses to help you take your Spanish to the next level. To sign up for the Learn Spanish with Music course and get our special Black Friday deal, go to SpanishConSalsa.com slash course. That's SpanishConSalsa.com slash course. This deal is only available through Black Friday, so make sure you check it out now so that you don't miss out. So for the last time, the link to sign up is SpanishConSalsa.com slash course. Bienvenidos! Welcome to the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast, the show for Spanish learners that love music, travel, and culture. Close your grammar textbooks, shut down the language apps, and open your ears to how Spanish is spoken in the real world. Let us show you how to go from beginner to bilingual. Here is your host, certified language coach, Tamara Mari. Hola y bienvenidos al episodio 99. Welcome to episode 99 of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. This is it. Next week, we're celebrating episode 100 of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. And this week, we're doing a Spanish challenge in our Facebook group where you'll get an opportunity to practice speaking Spanish each and every day. And of course, we're giving away more prizes this week. So if you're not already in the challenge, just go to LearnSpanishConSalsa.com slash Facebook to sign up as a member of our Facebook group and you'll be able to participate in this week's challenge. This week, I'm excited to share my conversation with Ero de Jesus. She's a trilingual copywriter, author, and translator who speaks English, Spanish, and Japanese. Ero is the founder of Morenita Mami, a blog where she shares her experiences as a black mother raising a multicultural family. She's also the author of the new book, Melanin Tro to Languages, a guide to multilingual parenting, freelancing, and socially conscious language learning. 
In our conversation, we talk about the practical way that she approaches language learning in her family, how she keeps her motivation going while juggling her career and being a mom, and the best way to get started making money from your language skills, even if you don't think you're ready yet. I really enjoyed chatting with Errol, and you have to check out her Instagram so you can see a picture of her adorable son, Christopher, who just turned two years old. I'll also include a picture in the show notes page so you can see this adorable little boy. And he was also with her during the interview, so you might hear him in the background a little bit. <laughs> but uh, he's absolutely adorable. Uh, but check out the show notes page at learnspanishconsalsa.com slash 99. So learnspanishconsalsa.com slash 99. Uh, and you can see Errol's beautiful family. Errol also has a gift for all of the listeners of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. So make sure you stick around to the end of the episode so you can claim your free gift. And now my conversation with Errol de Jesus. Hola, Errol. Bienvenida a Learn Spanish Con Salsa. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So... Errol, thanks uh, so much for taking the time to to join us. I know we connected initially at the Sisters Only Language Summit, and that's how I found out about you and your passion for languages. And I also understand that you recently wrote a book, so we'll get into that a little bit later. We'll delve into uh, you know your experience in in becoming an author, first time author. Uh, but first, tell us a little bit about you and uh, what it is that you do exactly. Yeah, so my what takes up a big chunk of my day is actually marketing. I help an association management company do marketing for different associations. So for the bulk of the day, I am doing a lot of like emailing. I'm on social media. I'm usually getting distracted and looking at Twitter. <laughs> But when I'm focused, <laughs> I do my best to... Um, They do a lot of like social justice events and uh, some, some really cool things that really align with my values. But um, once that's over, I spend a lot of my time blogging and connecting with people to help grow my business and, and to keep language as a part of everything that I do. How did you get involved in language learning in the first place? Because I know that, you know, growing up in the U.S., a lot of people just say, okay, all you have to do is speak English, right? <laughs> you don't, you don't need to learn another language for your career. You don't really, um, you know, have to, unless you plan on moving abroad or something like that. So what is it that got your interest uh, peaked in language learning in the first place? And just tell us a little bit about what languages you speak as well. Yeah. So I grew up in Houston, Texas, and um, I grew up in a neighborhood that's predominantly black and Hispanic. Um, and I think The first time I kind of grasped what it means to be bilingual, multilingual, was um, there was a girl in my class who was looking at a website, it was like computer time ancillary. And it was all in Spanish. And I asked her if she could understand it. And she said, yeah, yeah, I understand. I speak Spanish. And I was like, wait, 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 back up, back up. So you're speaking English to me right now and you can speak Spanish. She's like, yeah. And I was like, get out. <laughs> You can't speak two languages. <laughs> Wait, get the, shut the front door. Is this for real? And I was just, I just sat there like, wow. I think I had to have been around like 11 or so. And, um, but what got me, so, you know, that I saw multilingualism speaking another language as otherness. It's like, okay, other people can be bilingual, but not me. I'm already like, you know, a child. <laughs> um, I can't possibly learn another language right now. I already speak English and, you know, I've been getting along just fine. I don't pay bills. I live with my mom. <laughs> I'm 11. I don't have to learn <laughs> another language. Um, but one night my sister had found a phrase book, a Japanese phrase book that my mom had lying around the house. She told my mom, she said, mom, why did you, why did you buy this book? You know, are you studying Japanese? My mom was like, no, I just, I don't know. I just bought that thing. Don't, don't study Japanese. Don't even bother. It's, it, it's too, it, it's too difficult. You know, it's impossible. And my sister, she's my twin sister, by the way. She was like, I'm going to learn this language. It's not impossible. And then I said, let's study it together. It'll be our secret language, our secret twin language. So we started studying together. And, and I think that was when I finally kind of understood that, you know, you can learn a language later in life, quote unquote, or even if you're not raised in a multilingual or bilingual home, 
you can still embrace learning a language. And um, what was funny was a lot of people told me, why would you want to study Japanese? There are no Japanese people here to learn Spanish. And I said, no, I want to do Japanese. And um, I was, I don't want to say stubborn, but that's how I felt for like an entire decade. And I pushed and I pushed <laughs> to keep studying Japanese. And I went to Japan. I had won a speech contest. I worked really hard. Actually, I, I've done several speech contests and you have to have like perfect pronunciation and like perfect stage presence and all that stuff. I just kind of developed this like perfectionism with speaking Japanese. So the first time I went to Japan was through the speech contest that I had won and it was just for two weeks. I solo traveled, I had no money. I survived on Tinder dates and the kindness of strangers and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but the second time I went, I, I had several scholarships. I was I was studying abroad and I just absolutely hated it. I hated being on a schedule. I hated having to study. I was like, I wanna live the language. I don't wanna just study it and have my head buried in like a textbook. Like that's not, that, that's not me. You know, like I don't vibe with that. So the second time around was really difficult. And I came back to finish my senior year in college where I was majoring in Japanese. And then I met, there was this cute guy at this restaurant I was working at and I said hello to him and he said, no hablo inglés, and I fell in love. And so then, <laughs> from that moment on, I knew he was the one. <laughs> I was like, well, let's go out on a date and see how that goes. But, you know, I, I have a plan to be back in Japan when I graduate. So this isn't going to go anywhere. But, you know, you're cute. Let, let's hang out. And our first date was just us going back and forth on Google Translate on our phones because I didn't speak much Spanish. I memorized some of it from middle school, but like I said, I would get in trouble in middle school because I'd sneak in my Japanese phrase books and textbooks and my teacher would be like, what are you doing? I'm like, that's not Espanol, put that away. <laughs> <laughs> so now all of that came back to bite me in the butt because it's like, oh, well, now you actually need to use Spanish, Errol. <laughs> you're, trying to, you're trying to impress this cute guy. And I was just, a part of me, I was just like, Stand, like I don't know how to describe it like beside myself like is this really happening am I really falling in love with someone who only speaks Spanish like that that's not in our plan Errol like you can't do this to us and I was just like sorry <laughs> a <laughs> whole decade of Japanese study down the drain <laughs> <laughs> but, and you know what that's how that's how it felt I was just like well I'm not in the country um I'm not you know I don't have any family members or like super close friends who are Japanese so I just felt like well I'll just and, and another big thing for me was after I graduated I was like well I'm staying in the U.S. so I need to find a job here right and I live in Minnesota and it was like anything Japanese language related was working for car companies automobile industries out in like Indiana Ohio and I'm like no I'm not going over there I just kind of felt like what do I do with this with this you know this language power that I have and now it feels like a liability not a liability necessarily but it just feels like like for example going into job interviews and, and them seeing on my resume oh you majored in Japanese oh you speak Japanese like I sure do and I'm like okay well moving on <laughs> like here's here's how this company works and you won't be using any Japanese here and I kept running into that and I kept blaming that on the fact that I wasn't either physically in Japan or in um, a state where, like California, you know, where there are like uh, a lot of Japanese language speakers. So after my son was born, well, when I realized I was pregnant, I knew, okay, I'm gonna raise this baby bilingual, English and Spanish. I think towards when he was about a year old, I got a message from my Japanese professor and she asked me, are you speaking Japanese with your baby? And I said, why would I do that? <laughs> do I look Japanese to you? I'm not going to speak Japanese with this baby. And I remember she said, you know, well, you studied it for such a long time. It just, it would be, it, I just, I, I thought that you would share that with your son. And I was like, oh man, yeah, you're kind of right. So I, I was just kind of torn. I, I just felt that, well, I'm not Japanese. I don't have really close Japanese friends. It would just, you know, if I'm in public and I'm speaking Japanese to this baby, what would people think of me? I do ningajo, which are, are the, the cards that go out at the end of the year to like friends and family. And I've collected those over the years from uh, host families I've stayed with in Japan, uh, my Japanese friends, Japanese teachers. And I uh, kept them in a box and I brought them out for the end of the year. I was like, well, I want to send out some new ones. I, it's been a while since I've done any. 
and my son was was playing with the cards and looking at them and I was like you know what I I should probably start speaking Japanese to him because I'd hate for him to find these cards one day and be like mom what is this I can't read it and I'm like, oh, yeah, it's Japanese. I like to speak it, by the way. And he's like, what? Mom, <laughs> why did you never tell me this? So I was like, I don't want it to be a surprise. I don't want it to be like this. And I guess, you know, a part of me brought some, like, baggage with Japanese because the experiences that I had in Japan, like I said, my second time there when I studied abroad was really difficult because I faced a lot of culture shock and a lot of isolation. I wouldn't see another Black person for days on end. Um, I remember one time I had turned on the TV while I was in Japan and it was about uh, a black man getting gunned down in Texas. And I was like, wow, you cannot escape this. <laughs> like there's just no getting away from your blackness, right? My blackness. And I guess a part of me had thought that if I studied Japanese or especially with my experience with speech contests was I really loved the look on the look on people's faces when they would hear me speak Japanese. They would say stuff like, oh, it's like you're Japanese. I'm like, oh, that's great. Yeah, so I don't have to worry about being black. But then when I actually got to Japan, a lot of people wouldn't even speak Japanese to me because of, you know, my face, how I look. I'm not, I don't look Japanese. And a lot of them just assumed that, yeah, you know, you speak English, so I'm going to speak English to you. And I'll never forget, I was at this, um, I really love okonomiyaki. It's like a Japanese style pizza. It's a savory pancake. And I walked in there, I used to go there every day. And I walked in there and I told the lady that I wanted the table because I wanted to order some okonomiyaki. I told her all this in Japanese. And I hear her go in the back where the manager is and she asked the manager, does that woman speak Japanese? I'm like, I'm right here. <laughs> like I am literally standing right here. Um, so that was something that I dealt with a lot in Japan. And if I did speak Japanese to someone, like if I got lost, and um, I walked up to someone and was like, hey, do you know how I can get to XYZ? They would just be like really shocked. And, you know, sometimes the shock value was nice. It was like a good ego boost. But some days it was just like, oh, come on. You see me walking in this neighborhood like every freaking day. Like, Why is it like, how would I, why would I come here and not speak the language? When I thought about, I guess, and this as a parent as well, it's like, I don't want my child to have the same negative experiences that I had but in that moment seeing him with the New Year's cards and him playing with them it's just like well you know if I don't want anything to happen to him nothing's gonna happen to him I think it's totally normal especially for black people learning languages to go through the microaggressions to navigate how to talk about your your identity your racial identity all of that I think is a crucial part of the language learning of a lang language learning journey that unfortunately doesn't really get addressed in textbooks. I, I certainly don't remember ever talking about, hey, how do we say I'm black <laughs> in this language? Because that's just something we didn't talk about in the classroom or if it was brought up, it was like, all right, we're getting off topic. We need to get back to verbs <laughs> or something like that. So yeah, I just, I, I, you know, in that moment I told myself, just, just start speaking Japanese to him, share that with him and just let him know that, you know, he gets to choose how he wants to go about using, you know, his languages, the languages that I'll expose him to. And there's, there, there was really no reason. Well, I guess one thing that also held myself back was, well, not I guess, I know for a fact what really um, brought my reservations was the fact that I'm not a native speaker of Japanese. And I felt comfortable only speaking Japanese, excuse me, Spanish and English to the baby because, oh, I have a native speaker nearby. My husband, he can correct me if I ever say something wrong. But with Japanese, it was like, even though I've said it for a really long time, I still make mistakes. Like the subject particles, wa and ga, like I know, I, like, there's like so much written about how to tell the difference and I still get it wrong. So I was just like, if I make that kind of mistake with my baby, I'll never forgive myself. Classic perfectionism, right? You have won yeah. speech competitions in Japanese and you're still like, oh, my Japanese isn't good enough to talk to a baby who doesn't know any <laughs> Japanese at all. So I definitely understand how you feel because I felt the same way too with my son. I said, well, you know, I'm not a native speaker of Spanish. I don't want to give him, you know, my horrible accent. I mean, I, I definitely get it, you know, especially because sounds are so important in language that you really do. I think the more you study language, the more you learn the intricacies of it, especially when it comes to pronunciation, that you just have this respect for it. And you go, you know, I don't want to butcher 
the language, even if even if you're doing pretty good, right? Because you know you're not a native speaker. So I, I understand the sentiment, but I think that, you know, as parents, that I think not wanting our children to to kind of be exposed to to errors or mistakes or bad fortune of any kind is just a natural feeling. But I think that we have so much more to offer them. You know, like when you said you just decided to to speak to him in Japanese and to give him that gift of something you had to struggle for. And now he doesn't have to because he has you. So I think get, getting over that is a great lesson. And I think it's something that, you know, when you talk about raising your children multilingual, that a lot of people probably have have had hangups about too. So I was going to ask you, since you have, you know, English and Japanese and Spanish all in the house, you've got all those three languages. How do you approach exposing your son to that? And do you have, you know, a, a specific plan you follow, like one parent, one language or something like that? Or do, are you more sort of free flowing with your approach to exposing him to languages? So, yeah, that's a really good question, because when I it was actually, yeah, 2020, the year started and I said, I want to go about using juggling three languages in the household. I live with one native speaker, Spanish. I'm a non-native speaker of Japanese. How do I go about doing this? So I was looking at different like Facebook groups and websites and immediately like right away it was like you know are there any black people doing this <laughs> that was like my question um because I'm seeing all this great advice and all this wonderful yeah this is my story this is how I did it and then I see like the images I'm like oh okay but is there any sisters out here doing this in theory it all sounded great we'll have you know Japanese language time Spanish language time or English only time like yeah it's awesome and then in actuality, it was like, what? I'm not doing this. <laughs> like, I'm too tired to, to be so anal about when I'm going to use a certain language with my kid. This like impractical, like aim for, yeah, it's gonna be X, Y, Z, or it's gonna be just like this, all neat and compartmentalized. And then you realize I'm a human being. <laughs> not only are you a human being, you're a human being who is attempting one of the most difficult jobs on the planet, which is being a parent. So I think that, <laughs> you know, I, I did the same thing that you did uh, when I was looking for strategies, especially, you know, they say, oh, when they're babies, you have to expose them to the language. That way they won't, they'll speak without an accent. You'll have this like perfectly bilingual, multilingual child or whatever, right? And I realize the impracticality of it just because life, right? Like, it's just like you're trying to be a parent. And yes, it's nice if you're, you know, in this, I don't know where this perfect world exists where you're able to to implement all of these things. And if you have the resources and the time to do it, yeah. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. I think some of those strategies really do work for people. But I think depending on your personality, right, how you approach language learning and how you approach parenting, that's all going to impact the actual real life day to day exactly. language exposure that you have with your child. So, and it sounds like you're not um, just from what from talking to you that you're not a super rigid person anyway. You said you didn't like when you were studying Japanese to be put on a schedule when to, when you were studying abroad. So culturally, even I feel like that that's probably not a fit for you. So well, how does it look like now since your son is he's pretty young, right? So what how yeah. does your how does your language exposure look like in a you know really on a day to day basis? In the beginning, so it started January when I thought, you know, I want to do three languages. I'm competitive and I like winning money, or not just winning it in this case, but to get money, right? Because I've earned money through speaking languages. You know, when I won those speech contests, they had like gift cards and stuff. I was like, ooh, I like this. Keep this. Keep this going. So <laughs> I wanted to, I kind of wanted to set up a reward system for myself. And I kind of also wanted to find community where people were like, hey, this is great. You're inspiring me. So I was like, how do I keep this going? How do I make this part of my day to day? So I know that, yes, I'm also making a sustainable living, but I'm also staying on top of learning languages. As a parent, how do I, how do I go about doing my language goals that's inclusive of everyone in the house? I would say that by now, I feel a lot more confident in how I wanna go about setting goals for myself and my son. It's been really helpful to mix in business and my my language learning goals because there is a lot of a crossover there because I started doing translation. I liked it. I liked it because that meant that, you know, I was using languages and I was getting paid at the same time. I was doing what I love and I was getting paid to do it and I was getting better at languages as I was writing. Yeah, I felt that just creating those goals really helped and the fact that I could be flexible with the structure and also be kind to myself, not just as a parent, but as a language learner. One of the things that I really loved about 
speaking Spanish with my husband back when we were dating was that there was no structure. Um, I was just, I would mess up all the time. I would conjugate verbs incorrectly. Sometimes I used to ask him stuff like, is this a, is this a verb? Is this an adverb or is this a noun? And he would just nod his head. And I think like a couple of weeks ago, he just said, you know what, baby, I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't know what any of that stuff is. And when you ask me, I just nod my head. <laughs> I'm just like, why? why? And, and I just kind of, that was just so new to me and I really liked it. So for, and I, I, did, I, don't, I don't even think I picked up a textbook the, the like first few years we were dating. Just, I listened to him day in and day out, and I didn't want to share this because it's in my book, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and share it. So I like to, because my Japanese is, is, is it's at a pretty good level, I like to study Spanish in Japanese, <laughs> if that makes sense. At some point during the quarantine phase, I decided, oh, I'll just learn Arabic and Portuguese at the same time. That was an interesting couple months, but um, <laughs> but what I, what I noticed when I was having my... my um, Arabic lessons is that I kept relating it back to Spanish because there are some similarities mm. between the two but I yeah. also just like some of the grammar rules and like how there's masculine and feminine and then just some of the pronunciation it just it just really helped me so similar to, like, to what you were saying with with Japanese and Spanish I did something similar with Arabic where I just said you know what? I'm going to learn Arabic with Spanish so I actually found a podcast that was Arabic for Spanish speakers and I started <laughs> using that and, and trying to use that to relate. So I was going to ask just in terms of, you know, using your, since you're multilingual, right? You, you have, it's not just one, you know, translating everything from English to Spanish or vice versa. You've got this, this exposure to Japanese and you've got this knowledge of how languages work. So is there anything in your experience with learning Japanese that has helped you with your Spanish? I know you approach both of the languages very differently. It sounds like Japanese, you did more formal study, but with Spanish, you sort of let things flow. And I am really curious as to how you went from that first day with Google Translate to where you are now. But <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything that you were able to apply from your Japanese to your Spanish? Oh my God. Let me tell you. So, like I said, I've done Japanese speech contests, many of them. And even the one where I won, after I did my speech, I had to go to like this booth where someone gives you feedback on your speech. I'm like, stop. I'm like nervous. I'm about to throw up. Don't tell me how I did. Everyone keeps telling me that my intonation is off. And I got told that for years, like over and over again. Like my Japanese teacher would tell me this too. She's like, Ariel, your intonation's off. And I would just be like, what the heck is an intonation? <laughs> like, I don't know what this is. So I never paid attention to intonation. But when I, like I said, when I started listening closely to my husband and I understood that being able to place emphasis on certain vowels could change the meaning or even the tense, right, of a word. Well, yeah, yeah, the meaning too, because Papa is, is, well, Papa is the potato and Papa is the father, right, the dad. So that kind of made me, go back to how I was approaching speaking in Japanese because I was like, well, you know what? I would usually ignore things like this, but I, sh I should actually go back and see. So I, I know this is kind of reverse because it was Spanish that actually helped me revisit how I was speaking Japanese. <laughs> well, that's interesting that it, it happened in reverse for you. And I think that kind of proves that, you know, when you approach language from this purely academic um, mindset that you do miss out on a lot of things, especially when it comes to the spoken language. Like if you're not paying attention and you're looking at the words on the page, you might think that, you know, oh yeah, well that it's the verb comer. They all look alike. Right. But like you said, you know, it's very different to say, you know, yo como versus comio. Like that's, yeah. that's like a completely <laughs> different meaning. Right. So I think that your experience has proven just that you know, you've got to really focus on all of your different skills, whatever language you're learning, <laughs> and <laughs> that you you really do have to pay attention to pronunciation if you're going to get it right. And intonation is important, you know, and that's why I always yeah. tell people that when you're learning Spanish in particular, that you really got to focus in on, you know, a, a region or a country because intonation is, is different depending on where you are in the Spanish speaking world. The accents are different. Yeah. And if, if you're trying to get used to all of them at the same time, like you're probably going to be unsuccessful in improving your listening comprehension. So I always uh, harp on that. But I think it's really important. And I think your experience has has kind of, you know, even proven that even though, you know, you started out with Japanese and you came to Spanish in this more organic way that you're able to apply that to 
you know, now having a multilingual household, which I think is amazing for your son. And hopefully he'll see the benefit in that when he gets older. Errol, I wanted to thank you for taking time to chat with me today. But before I let you go, I can't end this conversation before I ask you about your book, because I know you wrote a book and you are you have some tips for how people can get started making money from languages, which I also love that you integrated business with language learning, because I think it's something we often shy away from. I think there's this purest view of like, oh, I, I have a passion for languages. I can't corrupt it with you know, rewards. But I think that, you know, it is a great motivation to, to get paid for your expertise, right? So tell us a little bit about your book. And I think you also have a giveaway for our listeners, uh, if they want to learn how they can start making money with the languages that they speak. Yeah, the book was actually a result of a client telling me that they didn't want to publish my blog articles on multilingual parenting. So those blog articles, just they just sat there. And then I said, you know what? Let me piece these together and make it for Black language learners by a Black language learner. Because working with a lot of white editors, I would get a lot of um, what I wanted to say about being Black and multilingual. I would kind of get that edited. Or I would just feel that ah, it feels awkward to mention. So I wanted to like move past that and just be very open about Um, The fact that, yes, we experience microaggressions when we travel or when we're learning a language or when we struggle to navigate how to talk about our racial identities or someone someone else's racial identity in a language. And just talking about how we can overcome that and how we can go about that, specifically in Spanish and Japanese. But there's also general language learning tips on there, like how to balance learning multiple languages, how to set goals and things like that. And my favorite part, personally, I really had a blast writing this chapter, was, you know, fun phrases you can yell at your kids, if you yell at them. But (laughs) 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 But yes, to get the, but right at at the end, uh, we're one of the free, yeah, the free chapter there is about um, getting paid to use your language skills because as you said there are a lot of people that talk about how they have a passion for languages but you know business itself is a language so you can be awesome at a language and you're translating for free like your homegirl calls you up and is like can you translate this for me but you don't tell her well yeah here are my rates like people don't think to do that it's like oh yeah I'll help you out we're cool friends it's like yeah I know but you need to get paid <laughs> to do that because that's you know, language is, is more than just, it's not like going to the store and buying a, or, you know, buying something and, you know, you're done. It, it's, it's a very, it's more than just a transaction, right? It's, it's a way of communicating with people. And if you can facilitate that process, you should be getting paid. You should not just be getting a, a thank you, although a thank you is nice, but, you know. I like my thank you in cash or check. So uh, <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but I like, you know, that's a special kind of thank you. And I love getting thank yous like that. But, the, and there's also, you know, especially when you get started with figuring out like, you know, how much should I charge? Like you want to learn how to really figure out, you know, how to market your language skills and how to, you know, showcase the value of what you know, because knowing another language, that's a, that's a very, that's a superpower right there. Um, so I connect with a lot of project managers at translation companies. I connect with a lot of creative directors who happen to be multilingual. And that's led to some pretty nicely paying projects for me. Um, and, and I still continue to use it. And so um, I love to share that with people and just let them know that, you know, what's standing between you and that paycheck is you. And so uh, where can folks find your book if they want to get a copy of your book? And what's the name of your book, too? Because you didn't mention yes, that. <laughs> it is called, yeah, yeah, that would help, right? It's called Melanin Intro, Melanin Intro to Languages, uh, a guide to multilingual parenting. Uh, and it is available on my website at morenitamami.com, M O R E N I T A, mommy, M O M M Y.com. And if folks want to get in touch with you, are you also on Instagram? How, how can folks get in touch with you on social media? Yeah, so I am on Instagram at Monanita Mami. Uh, I also tweet random things about multilingual parenting at Monanita Mami. Well, gracias, Errol. Thank you for being a part of the Learn Spanish Consalsa podcast. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Errol and that you found her story inspiring. Now, if you want to get a free copy of one of the chapters of her book, Melon Intro to Languages, go to our show notes page at learnspanishconsalsa.com slash 99. 
That's LearnSpanishConSalsa.com slash 99. You'll see a link there so that you can download the chapter of her book on how you can get started making money with your language skills. So you definitely want to check it out. She has some great advice and some things you may not have thought about yet. So make sure you go to the show notes page, LearnSpanishConSalsa.com slash 99 to get your free chapter from the book. And don't forget, it's not too late to join our Spanish challenge this week. Just go to LearnSpanishConSalsa.com slash Facebook if you're not already in our Facebook group uh, and hop into the challenge. You will see a post. It's actually, I think, designated as an announcement. So it should show up right at the top of our Facebook group. So not too late if you want to jump in. Um, this is day two. So make sure you hop in there and win some more prizes to help you move your Spanish along. Next week on the podcast, I'll be breaking down the lyrics to another one of my favorite songs. And I'll be doing that with a very special guest. <laughs> and the song is inspired by my conversation with Errol. And you'll find out why next week on episode 100 of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. So make sure you hit that subscribe button so you'll be the first to know when our next episode is available. And as always, como siempre, I hope that something you heard today has helped you go one step closer from being a Spanish beginner to bilingual. Hasta la próxima. Thank you for listening to the Learn Spanish con Salsa podcast at LearnSpanishConSalsa.com. 